thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for reading our text tonight, and uh, want to welcome you. Thank you for being with us. We have a number of visitors with us, and we're uh, very glad to have each of you with us tonight. Among our guests tonight, the Gunn family is here. They're uh, former members of this church, and we're delighted always to see them. And there are people here who are visiting family and uh, visiting friends, and we want you to know that we're thankful that all of you are with us. Before we begin our study tonight, we've been asked to uh, remember, uh, especially in our prayers tonight, uh, Herman Beaver uh, from Wichita Falls. He has been suffering so many strokes. He is the brother of Dorothy Presnall and Claudette Blankenship. And uh, I would like to ask you if you would to bow with us now and we'll honor this request. Father, we thank you tonight for the blessing of uh, being able to worship you. We're thankful for the opportunity to lift up our voices and hearts in praise to your name. And Father, our prayer is that everything that we do tonight will be pleasing to you and will honor and glorify you and that we'll be encouraged and uplifted because of our time together. Father, we approach your throne tonight on behalf of Herman Beaver. We pray that you will bless him and bless the doctors and nurses and those who are caring for him. We pray that everything that he has need of will be met. And Father, we pray that you'll be with uh, Sister Dorothy and Sister Claudette and we're grateful for what they mean to us and we pray that you'll continue to bless them as they uh, have concern about their brother. Father, there are many people who are on our hearts tonight. Uh, we want to remember Brother Jess Killian. We pray, Father, that you will bless him and that he'll recover from his pneumonia and that uh, you'll watch over his family as they care for him and pray that you'll help him to be able to recover. Uh, Father, we pray for the family that uh, the Gastons brought before us this morning. We pray, Father, that you will help them, that you'll comfort them. And Father, we pray that you will help us as a church to let them know that, that, um, that we care for them. And may they see through our um, help, through the aid that we might give them, may they see the love of Christ. And may we have opportunity to influence them for Jesus. Father, we also want to uh, pray for our brother Mark McKee tonight. We pray, Father, that you will be with him in the days ahead as he undergoes various treatments, as he visits with various doctors. Father, our prayer is that, um, that he can be completely healed and that he can recover fully and that he can be able to be back and do all the things that he wants to do that he does so well. We pray that you'll be with Allison and Kylie and all of their family as they care for Mark and support them and help them to know of our love for them and help us to encourage them in every way that we can. Father, you know uh, how dear Mark is to many of us and uh, how much we love appreciate him. And we pray that he will be able to get well. We pray for others who are in need of our prayers tonight. Our list is long, but you know each one and you know each need. And Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to come before your throne. And may we um, bring comfort and encouragement to one another as much as we possibly can. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Well, we're beginning 2 Peter chapter 3 tonight. We spent um, a lot of time in the book of 2 Peter. We spent several weeks actually in 2 Peter chapter 2. And, and Peter is beginning to wrap up his thoughts. We believe this is some of the last, these are some of the last words that, that Peter wrote. Uh, he is maybe giving his kind of dying thoughts to uh, churches that he has worked with and he has influenced. These are churches that are scattered um, throughout, uh, north, uh, throughout uh, the northern part of Turkey and throughout uh, Asia and through other places. And Peter is writing to them and trying to uh, warn them and give them information that will help them in their walk with God. And we spent a number of weeks in chapter 2 talking about uh, the threat of false teachers and false teaching. And we, we detailed what Peter said about false teachers and um, how you can recognize false teaching. We spent a lot of time with that. And, and Peter, as you come to chapter 3, this chapter is really about uh, perseverance. That's what this chapter is about because... After Peter has warned the, the brethren, warned the church, warned all of us about false teaching and false teachers, um, Peter is saying to us, in essence, and he's going to say literally in this text, that things aren't always going to be the way that they are now. 
and things have not always uh, things are not always now the way that they have been in the past. Things are going to change and and um, because we live in this world and we are confronted with with people who want to undermine the teaching of scripture it's important for us those of us who are Christians who want to remain close to God who want to be loyal to Jesus Christ it is very important that we are able to persevere uh, to persevere means that we will we will stand strong that we will remain loyal, that we will be committed, that we will be faithful to God. Um, no matter what goes on in our lives, no matter what is thrown at us, and um, we all recognize how difficult that can be. We recognize how, how trying it can be, to, how tempting it can be to say, well, um, you know, those people sound good and, and the things that they say seem to be wise, and, and so maybe we should listen to them. Or we might say, Life is so tough and there are so many difficulties, it would be better if I just uh, kind of threw in the towel. But Peter is admonishing the church everywhere. And he's admonishing all of us that in the midst of trials and tribulations, in the midst of false teaching in a world that has lost its way, you stay faithful. You remain strong. You don't give up. You keep going. You persevere. Jesus said to his apostles that if you will remain loyal to me, I will be with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus said to the churches of Asia, be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. So, so we're going to spend uh, uh, some weeks dealing with 2 Peter chapter 3 because contained in Peter's words about perseverance, he's going to talk not only about persevering, but he's going to talk about the need for persevering until the end of time. If you live that long until the end of time, and so we'll discuss that uh, in the coming weeks. Um, so this is kind of a, a mini-series uh, dealing with perseverance. Um, perseverance is about the last day. You see, we tend to be this culture that puts too much weight on the first day. When you first get married, that's a wonderful day. But that's not the most important day. Um, the most important day is when life gets tough and you go through difficulty and you come to the last day. Um, we put a lot of emphasis on the first day that a, a child is born. But that's not the most important day. The most important days, as the child grows and as the child matures, the most important day is the last day. When we commit ourselves to Jesus, when we are baptized into Christ, that's an important day in our life. No doubt one of the most important. But it is not the most important. Because you can be baptized and you can fall away from Christ and you can turn against him. The most important day is your last day on earth. You're, are you still faithful to God? Are you still living for him in the last days? Are you still enduring? Are you still remaining loyal? And so perseverance is, is about being a, a good finisher. It's about being a concluder with Jesus and with your spouse and with your kids and with your friends and with your family and with the church and with the obligations. It's about persevering. Um, the Bible is a lot about perseverance. It's about continuing forward with the obligations that you have as a child of God. It's uh, the last day that matters most. It's the day the Bible calls the judgment day. It's the day we stand before God in judgment. So when Peter writes, he saves for this final chapter his exhortation to persevere and to finish well. His own life. Peter's own life is a good example uh, for those of us who have, um, who have fallen away at times, who have strayed, who have walked away from God, who have made bad mistakes. Peter was that guy. He was the guy who denied Christ three times. One time the text says that he cursed and swore that he had never known Jesus Christ. Peter was the one who said, I will never deny you, though every man denies you. Peter is the one who said, though everybody else walks away, we will not walk away because where can we go? Peter was that man who said, I would never ever deny my Lord. I would never forsake him. But as you know, Peter did that. He, he did just that. He denied Christ during the darkest days of his life. He denied that he knew Christ. But the Bible says that Jesus had already told him, I know that you're going to do this because I know that you're weak. 
And all of us find ourselves that way. We're not always as strong as we should. And so Jesus said to Peter, I know that you're going to fall away. But then Jesus said, when you come back to me, when you repent, I want you to go and strengthen other people. And guess what? Peter did exactly what Jesus commissioned him to do. Jesus had told Peter in Matthew chapter 16 that he would be the one who would open the doors to the kingdom of heaven. He said upon this rock, this confession that you've made, um, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been loose in heaven. And it was Peter who stood up on the day of Pentecost. You see, Peter fell away from Christ. He denied him. But he repented and he came back and he remained loyal. He persevered unto the end. And so there are two or three uh, aspect, aspect of perseverance that I want us to notice in this text tonight. The first is uh, to persevere in the word of God. If we are going to remain loyal to Christ, if we are going to remain faithful, we must persevere in the word of God. And so notice his words. This is now, beloved, the second letter that I'm writing to you in which I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of remembrance. I, I love the way Peter begins by saying, uh, beloved, the first thing he says is that if you're a Christian, you are beloved. That's an amazing concept. Because you see, outside of Christianity, the world religions are not big on the love of God. Uh, Christianity is in large part, all about the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God demonstrated his love, Paul said in Romans 5 verse 8, for us that even while we're sinners, Christ died for us. Christianity, in its very essence, is about the love of God. Christianity exists because God loves us. And when Peter writes to these people who are facing um, difficulty, they're facing persecution, they're facing the threat of false teaching, Peter says, you need to know that if you are a Christian, you are beloved. We say this sometimes in this place, but I don't think we can say it enough. It is vitally important that we, if we are the people of God, that we recognize how much God loves us. That we recognize that if we are his children, that he loves us deeply, that he loves us passionately, that he loves us with all that he has, that he was willing to give everything that he had to show his love for us. It is not that we are deserving or even undeserving, but despite the fact we are ill-deserving, that God loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. God is a father who loves his children and every Christian is a child of God. Galatians 3 tells us we love our children and typically we love them unconditionally and that's the way that God loves us. God's love for us is unconditional. You are beloved. What an amazing statement. What this doesn't mean is that that we need to persevere in life as a Christian so that God will love us till the end. Look, God loves us whether we persevere or not. But the reason, the very fact that he loves us is the reason that we should persevere. That's why Peter is, is writing this letter. He says, I want to remind you that God loves you, that you are beloved, and you need to be faithful to God. You need to persevere to the end because of God's love for us. God doesn't love us if we persevere. God loves us whether we persevere or not. But we, he wants us to persevere and we persevere because of his love. We often forget what God has done for us. Just like a loving parent with a child, God keeps telling us truths that that we need to have rooted in our soul, that we need to put in practice in our lives. There's no perseverance in life without our persevering in the scriptures. He explains the scriptures by saying that these are the things that are written beforehand. Look at verse 2. I, I'm, I'm reminding you, he says, that you should remember the words beforehand, uh, spoken beforehand by the holy prophets, and the commandments of the Lord and Savior spoken by your uh, apostles. This is an amazing statement in verse 2. The commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So 
He begins by saying, I want you to be aware that everything that is written in Scripture comes from God. That you need to remember, don't ever forget that God loves you and he's given you his word. He's given you everything. But this statement says, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. The apostles who wrote the New Testament are the means by which Jesus speaks to us today. This is huge. Uh, some of you have a red letter Bible. And the red letter Bible will have in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, and part of Acts and Revelation, the words of Jesus Christ. They will be colored in red. But according to Peter, he is saying the whole New Testament should be read because it's all from Jesus Christ. All of it collectively, entirely, these are the words of Jesus. And this is important for us to recognize because, look, some people say today that I only want to listen to what Jesus says. I only want to listen to the words of Christ. I'm not really interested in what Paul had to say about church and about salvation and about worship and about life. Because Paul might, he might have been wrong, he might not have been wrong. Um, maybe Paul said some good things, but maybe Paul said some bad things. And, and Peter and John and others who wrote later on, um, maybe we don't have to listen to everything that they wrote. I'm interested in what Jesus said. But listen to how Peter describes the scriptures. You should remember the words spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken by the apostles. Here's what Peter is saying. Remember the Old Testament, remember the New Testament. Persevere in Scripture. Everything that the apostles wrote, they come from Jesus Christ. They are writing the words of Christ. They are if these are the words of Christ. So how can you, how can you be a Christian that's not persevering? Peter already told us in 1 Peter chapter 2, that verse 2, as newborn babes, they went along for the sincere milk of the word of God so that we can grow by it. Um, every time somebody says, I don't know if I believe God anymore. Or every time I hear somebody make a statement like I heard a, a, a young man, a, a brilliant young man say uh, one day, I just don't believe the things that I used to believe anymore. I want to say to the people, are you, are you meditating? Are you studying? Are you memorizing the scriptures? Are you allowing God to speak to you through the words of the Bible? These are the words of Jesus Christ, Peter said. And if you say, no, I'm not studying my Bible, I'm not reading my Bible, then that's a huge issue. That, that's always going to be a problem in your life. And so don't ever quit growing. That's why he says, like newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. He's going to say later on in this very chapter, in verse 18, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Don't ever quit studying the word of God. And it's more than just reading the Bible. That's, that's great to read the Bible. But study, what does the Bible say? What does it mean to my life? How do I apply scripture uh, to my life? Jesus is teaching us through scripture. And so how is your time in scripture? Perseverance in life is, is inextricably uh, connected to perseverance in scripture. The more you stay in the word of God, the stronger you will be. The more you study the word of God, the more ability you will have to be able to defeat Satan when he comes at you. You remember when Jesus was being tempted by Satan over there in Luke chapter 4, three times that are recorded in our text, Jesus said to Peter, it is written. And each time Jesus gave a quote from the Bible, it is written, it is written. And in giving quote from Old Testament scripture, Jesus not only showed his knowledge of scripture, but he validated scripture for all of us. Jesus used scripture to defeat Satan. David said, your word have I hid in my heart so that I might not sin against you. David said, your, your word is like a, a light into my path, that it guides my way. David said, your word are, is my, the thing that I meditate on day and night. It is the very sustenance that, that feeds me, that gives me the ability to be able to walk through life. 
the people who are strongest in this life, the people who are strongest in their family, the strongest husbands and the strongest fathers and the strongest mothers and wives, the strongest people in our communities and the strongest people in the church are people who have come to love and to learn and to know the Word of God. Perseverance in life will be connected always to per perseverance in Scripture. God has given us his mind and his heart and we need to listen to it. I remember hearing an old preacher say a long time ago that a Bible that is falling apart is usually owned by persons who, whose life is not. That means that, that they've studied their Bible, that they continue to grow in the teaching of Scripture. But Peter says perseverance is not only through Scripture in verse uh, 1 and 2, but he also tells us that, that perseverance comes through, um, through some persecution in our life. Literally, Peter talks about scoffing. Notice with me uh, verse 3, knowing this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come, or your Bible might say scoffers will come, with their mocking following after their own lust. And they'll be saying, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. So Peter is saying, not only are you going to have these false teachers who come into the church and who come into the world in chapter 2, but you're going to have these people who are mockers of God. They're scoffers and, and, and they're going to come. And, and here's the big idea. If you love Jesus, you read the Bible and you study the Bible and you try and live a life that is obedient to Scripture out of your love for Jesus. And sometimes uh, people will make fun of you. You will. I mean, if you, if you spend a lot of time in Scripture, if you study the Word of God, if you grow in Scripture, people are going to make fun of you. Um, furthermore, if you on a television and you watch it very off, very much, you'll notice that, that the only minority group in the world that is okay to stereotype and to make fun of is that group that we call Christians. You can make fun of Christians all day long. Scoffing has become an art, if you will. If you, um, if one person says they're a Christian, they do something or say something they shouldn't, then all Christians become re uh, replicated and, and we get stereotyped and scoffed. If one Christian makes a statement that is absurd, people say that's the way all Christians think and that's the way all Christians speak. If your fear is in the Lord, then Peter is saying you will not allow scoffers to define you. You'll not allow them to destroy you. You'll not allow them to, um, to discourage you. And they will not be able to dissuade you from being faithful to God. You won't become mean or arrogant. You won't, uh, you won't be overly critical of others. But you'll have a heart and an attitude that says, how can I love these people and serve them even when they're making fun of Christians and they're making fun of the Bible and they're making fun of Jesus. Rather than taking a personal offense, we need to know the Bible teaches that the offense is not personally uh, um, attached to us, but the offense is toward Christ. When people ridicule Christians and they make fun of, of Bible believers and they make fun of those who study the scriptures and who know the scriptures, they don't really care about us. They're making fun of Jesus. They're making fun of the God who authored the Bible. But it doesn't make sense. The scoffers want, uh, what they want to do is, they want to argue uh, oftentimes chronologically. They want to argue theologically. Uh, let me give you a couple of words here. They will say, notice what Peter says here. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? What they're asking is, um, okay, fine. Uh, where is Jesus? If this Jesus is who you say he is, um, the prophets have been telling you that he's coming again. The apostles told you that he's been coming again. Where is Jesus? Why hasn't he come back? They say everything is the way that it always has been uh, since the beginning of time. The problem is they don't know the teaching of scripture, number one. And number two, they're incorrect about the last thing they say. Everything is not the way that it has been since the end of time. Everything is working toward a conclusion. 
Everything is working toward an end. We read in passages like Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 that says when the time was right that God sent forth his son born into this world. Jesus came just when God wanted him to come. Nothing that has ever happened in our world when it comes to working toward eternity has ever been accidental. Nothing that God has done has been an accident. Before God created the world, there was a conference with the Godhead. And there was a discussion about how the world would be saved. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3 verses 9 through 11 tells us that the church was a part of this plan that was created before the world ever, before the world was created. That God planned how he would redeem man and that he would do this through his son and that he would do this through the church. That's been a part of God's plan since before the world was ever created. God planned to bring uh, Abraham into this world. He planned for Abraham to become the father of a great nation. God planned for Moses to be a leader of the people of God. God planned to give the commandments uh, of the old law to Moses. He planned for the nation of Israel to exist for a time and to be governed by uh, his scriptures in the Old Testament. God planned that. He planned the time when Jesus would come again. And he planned the time that the church would be established. Peter goes into great detail in Acts chapter 2 describing how that God had prophesied through people like Joel and David and even Jesus himself that when the time was right the church would be established. And it was on that day in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, around the year 33, after 33 AD, uh, after Jesus was born, that the church was established. God planned that, and God planned for when Christ will come again in the clouds. He planned that time when the world would end. God has that in his mind. He hasn't told any one of us. And so one of the things that you can know, whenever you read or hear some uh, modern day prophet talk about the, the time that Jesus is going to come back, and they give a date, you can know that they don't know what they're talking about. And if they get it right, it's by luck. It's not because they know. Because no one knows. Jesus himself said, no one knows the day or the hour. Not even the Son of Man himself. God has all of this in his mind. He has planned this. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 4 verse 1, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. All the mockers and scoffers... The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. That's the God who rules over all creation. The God who rules over all mankind. So that the text goes on to say, it will leave them neither root nor branch. There was an anticipation of judgment. There will be a judgment day. Jesus comes. And Jesus doesn't set the world on fire. He doesn't send everyone who refuses to obey him into immediate eternal destruction. But here's what he says in John 5, beginning in verse 25. Truly, truly I say to you, the hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. Now listen to verse 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this, Jesus said. For the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and they will come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. God has a plan. All things are not as they have always been. God's plan is working to a grand conclusion, a grand judgment day. And listen, every child of God, every Christian should be thankful for this. We should rest in this knowledge that we don't have to live in a world that is contaminated, contaminated by sin and death and darkness forever. We don't have to be here forever. Peter's going to talk at length about that in the next few verses. And we'll notice that in the coming weeks. 
There is a day of judgment that is forthcoming. Someday when God has, that day that God has declared, Gabriel, we believe, the archangel of God, will blow a trumpet that will be heard around the world. It will be a noise that will be heard by every living creature. And it will be a noise that will be heard by all of those who are in their graves. God will say, in essence, time shall be no more. There will be the great noise of the trumpet. The dead in Christ will be raised first. What that means is that someday that, that those who are in their graves will hear his voice, is what Jesus said, and they will come forth. If that were to occur during our lifetime, that means that on that day that we will be going about our normal activities, maybe you'll be at work, maybe you'll be at school, maybe you'll be involved in some sporting event, maybe you'll be shopping, maybe you'll be resting, whatever you're doing on that day, you'll hear the noise. The heavens will open up, you'll see things that you've never seen before. And all of a sudden, graves all around the world will begin to open and bodies will come forth from those graves. It'll be an amazing scene. It'll be something that, like, that we cannot imagine. Jesus said, all of those who are in the graves who hear his voice will come forth. Well, naturally they will. You remember what happened when Jesus went to the tomb of his friend Lazarus? You remember that, that Jesus... The, the sisters, Mary and Martha, the sisters of, of Lazarus, said to Christ, um, maybe both of them said, Lord, if you would have just been here, our brother would not have died. Jesus made a statement along the lines of, well, he's not dead forever. This is so that God could be glorified. And Jesus walked into that area where that tomb was, and somebody no doubt rolled back the stone. And Jesus shouted into the grave, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus walked out of that grave. And one preacher said that Jesus called out Lazarus' name because if he would have just said, come forth, everybody in the graves would have come out. That's what's going to happen on that day. Everyone will come forth. Those who have done good will be raised to eternal life. Those who have done evil will be raised to eternal destruction. And then Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that those who are alive will be caught up to the heavens to meet the Lord in the air. I, I don't believe that the Bible teaches anywhere that Jesus is ever coming back to this earth. There's nowhere where the Bible tells us he's going to set foot on the earth again. As a matter of fact, Paul tells us through the Holy Spirit that, that he'll come in the clouds and every eye will see him. So if you're alive, you'll see Christ on that day. The dead will be raised. And if you are faithful to God as a Christian, you will be raised from this earth to meet Jesus. And the text says in the fourth chapter of the Thessalonian letter, you will be with the Lord always. So will you ever be with the Lord this way. See, they were scoffing in the days of Peter. It was only about 30 years after the death and burial and resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And 2,000 years later, the scoffing is not diminished. Peter says in this text, in the last days, that phrase in the last days means the last period of time. We are living right now in the last days. That doesn't mean that Jesus is going to come back tomorrow in the clouds, but he could. And if we are really faithful to him, and if we really are what we should be, we will long for that day. We will anticipate that day. We will be like Paul, who said, I'm torn in my own mind, in my own heart, between two things. Whether to stay here and, and teach and preach to you and to help you, or to depart and be with the Lord, which Paul said is far better and when you read that phrase, when Paul says, it's far better, you think, no joke, Paul. <laughs> it's far better than what? It's far better than all of this is what it's far better than. And so we long for that day. And we say, sometimes, as the people did in the days of the first century, Maranatha, 
Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. I don't know how you feel, but I would be perfectly fine if this were our last night on this earth. There would be no more pain, no more heartache, no more tears, no more death, no more divorce, no more depression, no more dejection, no more disappointment. And so we're okay when we say, Lord, come quickly. There would be no more illness, no more heart disease. No more cancer. Like many of you, I've come to hate cancer. And so, because of those reasons, it's okay for a Christian not to be afraid of death and not to be afraid for the Lord to return. If you are a child of God, and you're living for him. You want that day to appear. Now these people, these scoffers who were coming, they were talking about, even though they didn't realize it, I believe, they were talking about the resurrection and eternal life. I don't think they knew what they were talking about. They were talking about dying and going to be with God, and they're talking about being in heaven. What they're saying is, ever since the fathers died, that would be in their mind when they made that statement the patriarchs, people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob it's always been the same you live, you die, you live you die, you live, you die, sin continues death continues where's God, where's the judgment where's the kingdom, they scoff and they mock they're actually articulating what is a primitive form of what we call naturalism it's the same thing we combat today let me say this tonight. Christianity is not opposed to science. In fact, science is contingent on the worldview of Christianity. That God created the world. That he, in large part, runs the world through his laws. That he intervenes providentially at times in the world. That he is involved in what is going on in the world. That he keeps everything orderly that he sustains the life of every human being Paul said to the people in Acts chapter 17 on Mars Hill that things that God has set things in order and God keeps them going and if you eliminate that there is no science because there's no stability by which to run the scientific method Christianity is not opposed to it it actually undergirds and underguards science but Christianity listen I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, but listen, Christianity is opposed to naturalism. Naturalism denies that there was a creator and that this creator sustains our lives. Naturalism denies that God made the world and that God providentially rules the world. Naturalism says there is no God. There's no spiritual aspect of our being that we are just atoms and molecules, that, that we are just flesh and bone, that we live and we die, that there's nothing before creation and there's nothing after death. Carl Sagan said it this way, the cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. Things don't change. There will be no end. There will be no beginning of a new world. Christians don't believe that. Science, I don't even believe, believe that. Science believes that the world had a beginning. They call it the Big Bang. We call it the Big God. Whether you believe it or not, either way there was a beginning. We know that the world is going to have an end. The world science calls it the second law of thermodynamics. We call it the judgment, the second coming of Jesus. Either way there's going to be an end. But the scoffers say, you know what? It's been a long time. We haven't seen any change. Everything's the way it always has been. The talk show radio host and the, the shock jocks of our world completely misrepresent what the Bible actually says and what we actually believe. They create a caricature of Christian Christianity that really is stereotyping and 
and they mock and they make fun of, of God. So Peter is saying to you tonight, if you can persevere through all of that, if you can remain loyal to all of that, I'm telling you that the best days in your life are ahead. The best days are ahead. No matter what you're dealing with tonight in your life, no matter what you're going through, if you remain loyal to Christ, if you persevere even when people make fun of you for your faith, if you persevere even when you're in the middle of pain, the brightest days, the best days are ahead for you. And we should say praise God and bring those days to us as quickly as possible. And in the next week, we're going to talk about a couple of examples that Peter gives. And then we'll talk about what he says about that time, the end of time, that last, not the last days, but what he says about the last day. I hope you'll stay with me. I want to encourage you to read 2 Peter chapter 3 over the next few weeks. Go back and read it again. Think about what we've talked about tonight, about the scoffers and the mockers, and about our persevering, and, and how Peter is going to explain this through illustrations that we are very aware of in our life. And then read again what he says in verses 9 and 10 and 11 and 12, because they're beautiful words for those who are children of God. And if you're not a child of God, tonight, your best days are not ahead of you. If you don't give your life to Jesus, if you've never obeyed him, the brightest days are behind you, not ahead of you. And so you can change all of that. You can change that through a choice and a decision that you make to give your life to him if you believe that he's the son of God. If you'll turn from your sin in repentance, if you'll confess his name and be buried with him in baptism, he'll make you his child. And he gives you promises that are beyond our ability to understand and comprehend. And if you're a child of God and you need some prayers of this church family, if there's something in your life that we can pray for you with about, if there's any need that you have, we invite you to come as we stand together and as we sing.